and here I am. Oops, I forgot to change something from when I was doing my recording earlier today. Uh, I had my February thing up there. There we go. That's what we want to have up instead of saying February because it's not February yet. But thank you guys for coming in for this Sunday. Uh, today we're going to be talking about something that really forms the basis for most of the programming here, which is the topic of love. We're going to talk about love and how, you know, what, what it means like to be, quote, in love and how somehow, let's see, this is too low here, somehow how women, uh, and of course, you know, not everybody, but this happens so much. You know, once a woman's emotions are triggered and she feels like she's in love, she's uh, most of them, you know, y'all be turning stupid. It's like your brains go on hiatus. Your morals kind of start crumbling. Your values and boundaries go up in smoke and you do everything that you can to, you know, while you're worrying about this man and pleasing him and being there for him and just you sacrifice so much of yourself. And it's really interesting and really kind of think kind of hard to find uh, women who can balance that. You know, they have a, they'll give and compromise and all that kind of stuff, but with healthy boundaries in place that they're never going to give too much. They're not going to let a relationship or a man deplete them. They're not going to feel overburdened. They're not going to do more than their fair share. They're going to make him, you know, perform to what he's supposed to be doing. But it's really hard to find women that will do that, at least, you know, do it consistently. A lot of people do it when they get mad. You know, they'll say, well, I've had enough of this. <laughs> but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where you are the same throughout the relationship and your man already knows this ain't going to fly, what he best do, and all this kind of stuff because, you know, you've laid that uh, foundation. Oh, let me get over here to the chat. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm just looking to take a quick peek and see who all is in here. Yes, all the usual suspects. Um, I suppose more people will start coming in as, uh, you know, they get the notifications, which are often slow. Let me first talk about, you know, there is a survey here. You have to be on YouTube, though, to get to it. Um, vote in that survey. It asks, you know, what your typical response is. And when you fall, you know, you feel like you're in love. And so far, the top pick at 36% is w women responding that they've never been in love. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. In sec the second place uh, is 32% of respondents are saying that when they fall in love, they act stupid. <laughs> they get stupid. 28% say equate love with heartbreak, pain, agony, you know, hurt, a lot of hurt. And then 4% coming in last uh, are the ladies who say that, you know, they go from man to man looking for love, trying to find it, not having much luck. So those are the, the responses that you can choose from. Uh, make sure you vote in the survey because I want to I want to start, you know, with every kind of live stream except what the fuck Tuesday, um, with you know topical live streams. I want to do a survey with them to just to kind of get an idea where the viewers are on the various topics. I think it's an interesting uh, little thing that YouTube added, so I want to take advantage of it. Are you fall in love with stupid people? Well, now let's let's talk about that because my grandmother always told us that all men are stupid. And at first I, you know, was horrified because I'm like, not my daddy, my daddy's special. Because, you know, I was a little kid, what did I know? I just was horrible. And, uh, you know, I thought it was horrible for her to say that. And she was like, but as the older I got, the more that I could see that she was right. And what we have to do as women is find a man that has a level of stupid that we can tolerate. That's the secret to a long and happy relationship, a long and happy marriage. What happens is you go, you get mixed, you get a mismatch. You get a woman who's, you know, very, very smart and she needs a man who's, you know, got like fewer issues 
and then but she gets one who has more issues or has issues that she can't really tolerate long term and then it ends all bad it's just all bad so i think if more women accepted the reality that every single man you meet is going to be stupid in some way shape or form every one of them they all have something wrong with them what you have to do ladies is like i said in one of the videos pick the things you only get five things right five things that he cannot have, would like to have, must have. If he got them five things, got to be a little flexible, you know? That's just the way it is. So let's talk a little bit. Oh, and hit that like and subscribe button if you're not already a subscriber to the channel. We got our video a day, February, coming up right around the corner, February, February 1st. And you want to make sure you don't miss one of those shows. They're all going to be excellent. And the theme is winning at life. Winning at life is the theme this year. Okay, so this article here is asked, how do you know if you're in love? How do you know? Because I think sometimes people are and they don't really know it. They don't identify it because they don't really, you know, they are not sure. What, what is this I'm feeling? Why am I feeling this way? What does this mean? Right? So this came from, is this psychology today? I think this came from psychology today and um yeah okay it did okay they have three key points you know how they do at the top of their articles so i give you three key points point one early in a relationship you may feel euphoria which is actually heightened neural activity in dopamine rich areas of the brain point two other ways to tell if you're in love include missing the person this corresponds to your commitment and feeling healthy jealousy. Hmm. And point three, Rush Bill's build investment model shows that the staying power of relationships takes mutual investment and commitment. Right. But see, now we're need we're mixing. They I don't know why they put that in here because the thing is how to know if you're in love. It doesn't talk about a commitment being associated with it. So that point three is, uh, so I don't know who decided was the editor on this. That should not have been in here as point three. But anyway, so the question is asked, how do you know if you're in love? And so here they go with their, let me see how many of it. There's seven points here that I will go over from psychology today. The kids are, yeah, yeah. Sher Sherry, I'm telling you, it's just unbelievable. Okay, let's see what they say. You know, these are all psychologists. So these are learned mental health professionals that write these articles. That's why I like to look there first. Okay, this author says that the first point, the first way that you would know is that you're essentially addicted to this person. The dopamine that they talked about is one of the points. It just floods your brain and you get that feeling of joy and happiness and excitement and, and just, you know, you want to skip around and fling flowers and stuff because you're in love so he says that love changes the brain and that euphoria that appears as heightened neural activity uh is linked to the reward system and areas associated with the pursuit of rewards huh that's really interesting so basically it's you get it's like a drug dopamine i mean you know what i mean it's essentially that's what it is so the more you're around this person that brings you this kind of neural activity, it's like a, you know, a cycle. So you're around them somewhere, you get the little dose of dopamine, it goes away, you go around and you miss them, right? So you go around them again, you get the dose. Stuff. So it becomes like this addictive thing. And I guess that's how people fall in love. Isn't that interesting? He says, point number two, you really want your friends or family to like this person. New evidence shows that people are often motivated to marshal support for someone that they are dating. That's very true. Cause like, you know, they'll bring you around, right? They, they bring around their partner and they, you know, and then later they'll say, well, you know, how did you like, him? how did you like? Him? And you know, they're all excited, right? They want you to, you know, feel the same way about the person that they did. And then if you don't, then they get all, you know, get, they get evil <laughs> and hateful and stuff. And you know, you don't like anybody. You don't want me to be happy. And, you know, they start lobbing lugs at you. It's like, no, I just don't see why you like this person because he ain't about nothing. 
he's just a bum that you just don't see it because you full of dopamine. Okay, but that is true. They, you know, they want, they really feel, they put pressure on you to like the person and think favorably of them and stuff. Point number three, this is what we're talking about is how to know if you're in love. You celebrate that person's triumphs, even if you yourself fail. Hmm. Point number four, you, t- you definitely like this person and this person likes you. Liking is different from love, but it's often a prerequisite for falling in love. That's true. You have to have some kind of favorable regard for the person to want to be around them repeatedly, which is what enables you to, you know, grow an emotional attachment to the individual and thereby fall in love. So that's why it always bothers me when people say you can't help who you love. Yes, you can, because you see you go around the person and you see that they're a fool from the jump. Why do you keep going around them? Why do you keep letting them call you? Why do you keep going on dates with him? You already know he's stupid. You know, you put yourself in a position where I guess I just sleep with him just one time and then you get sprung because he's ugly and stupid, but he got that magic stick. And the next thing you know, you just a complete fool. All right to dear, dear Deb. Oh, no. (laughs) What I done did. Let me tell you about my stupid decision. Remember I told you about about that Sagittarius man. You know, Leo's and Sag is supposed to be like the fireworks of the Zodiac. But he was stupid. I knew he was stupid. I wasn't trying to be around him like that. We were just buddies and I would see him like maybe once a month we would hang out or something. But I wasn't trying to be around him all the time. You know, I, you, you know this kind of stuff. And then that one time when he, he kissed me, I told you all about a couple of weeks ago, you know, snuck that kiss in and made me see Jesus. I already knew uh, he was never going to touch me again. I just, just, I kept my distance from him for a minute there to let that, you know, that die down. But, um, yeah, that could have been all bad, all bad. But yeah, so, you know, I didn't really like him. I thought he was stupid, you know. So if you got somebody like that around, but you keep spending time with him, time with him, time with him, laughing with him, joking with him, going places with him, having fun with him, they're going to grow on you. So that's why people who say, well, you can't help who you love, you're being delusional. You can very much help it. Just handle your business right. Okay, point number five, you really miss this person when you're apart. In many ways, how much you miss a person reflects on how independent your lives have become. If you're questioning whether you love someone, perhaps you should consider how much you miss him or her when you're apart. I don't miss nobody. Okay, point number six, your sense of self has grown through knowing this person. When people fall in love, their whole sense of self changes. They take on new traits and characteristics, growing in the diversity of their self-concept through the influence of their new relationship partners. In other words, the the before you falling in love part is different from the you after falling in love. Hmm. Yeah, I can see that because people change their habits. Like say you're normally a a night person, but your dude is a morning person that likes to jump out the bed at 6 a.m. and, you know, run to the court and play tennis or, you know, go to the gym and all this kind of stuff, right? You don't like that. You like to wake up at around 10, but you start, you compromise and you get up, you know, say he goes to the gym by himself and he comes back at like eight. Okay. Well, you get up at eight and y'all have breakfast together. So see, you've, you know, he's still got his same morning routine, but you've adjusted yours by two hours so that you can be, you know, around him more. Um, Sometimes your mate will have better habits, like with money, handling money and investment or savings. Um, Maybe you were used to eating out and taking out all the time, but your mate starts, you know, is a good cook. So they teach you some, how to cook some stuff and you start feeling better. You lose weight, your skin clears up and you have more money in your bank account at the end of the month. So, you know, there's a lot of things that we can pick up you know, from our partners, but is it limited to partners? Absolutely not. You can get that same kind of self-improvement from a relate, you know, a friendship with someone new. So it's not that it has to be someone you're in love with. It has to be someone that you respect and someone who's there, you know, to help you grow as a person, whether it's a friend, you know, same sex friend, just a platonic friend, an opposite sex platonic friend or a romantic partner. 
could also be a sibling, you know, or some kind of, you know, relative. But the, the main key thing is that is someone that you uh, respect and admire and that you trust enough to let them teach you things and, you know, kind of change yourself because you know that they're not going to ridicule you or use it against you. Those are the three components, I think, that are you know necessary. Now, we have people who write to this advice column, right? They in love. Where's that healthy changing part? The healthy part is not there. So this person, this psychologist must be talking about when you're in love and it's a healthy relationship, not just in love. But he didn't make that differentiation. I'm making it for you. And the final point uh, that he has is point seven. He says, when you are falling in love, you get jealous, but not suspicious. Ah, I see what he means. Yeah. The suspicious is who you call it. And you don't want to go through people's phones and all that kind of stuff. That's suspicion. Jealousy is, you know, you're there and you had a party and he's with you right there. I mean, but suddenly you look across the room and you see some girl grinning at him. Well, you feel that momentary pang and then it's like, you know, it's horrible. Your son's fathers are sad. No, 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 no. See, I never said you have babies with them. You marry them, none. I never said that. I just said it's supposed to be fireworks. That's all I said. I would never get with a sad man ever in the history of my life or the next 10 lifetimes that I have never. That's not going to happen. They crazy. Something's wrong with them. They're just this not wrapped too tight. And I can't do that. I like, you know, stability and predictability in my relationship. I don't like somebody who's flying off the handle going in a different direction. You zig and he zag. No, I can't do that. I like spontaneity and all that kind of stuff, but not when my emotions are concerned. I want your ass to be the same. Every goddamn day, you the same. That's what I need. Like a rock just sitting there, just being the same. That's what I need you to do. And, you know, cancer men are banned from your life. Yeah, they banned from mine, too. Ooh, no Gemini's, you know, I'm seriously, the okay, my choice in the Zodiac is very limited. I can do Taurus men, believe it or not. I can do Taurus men, as long as they're not overly Taurus. And Aquarius men, and I can go out and hang out and have a good time with Leo men, but no relationship. I can go out and hang out and have fun with Sag men, no relationship. Aries men, the same thing. So, you know. Me and Fireside, we get along good. It's fun. But mm -mm. no thanks. They're crazy. I don't want to be in a relationship where, because I would be in prison. Y'all would find, y'all would have to have a get a GoFundMe thing to get me out of prison. Say, like, Deb and Sing Sing, we need to get her out so she can do the show. <laughs> she done killed that man. I tried to. So anyway, um, yeah. So he says that. Uh, his relationship observers and people who watch romantic comedies know that love needs the buttressing of commitment to flourish into a stable and healthy partnership. That's true. Because you can feel all the in love you want to, but unless you have a commitment, it's not going to really go anywhere. Okay. Now, what I want to do today, well, the reason why I did that survey is to get an idea of you know, where everybody is, what kind of experiences you've had with romantic love. And then I want to open up the show so that you can call in and talk about your experiences with love. You know, how was it for you? Where do you think you went wrong? What were your expectations and how were they not met? Were you hurt? Is this a repetitive thing? Did you get into your love relationships with, you know, stars in your eyes and, and wishes and dreams of happily ever after and it blew up in your face? I'm trying to get an idea of what it is that's behind women, A, choosing the men that they choose, and then B, why do you give so much of yourself and sacrifice so much of yourself? And in a relationship, what, what is that? You know, how do you feel about that kind of behavior, especially if you've done it in the past. Why? Yes, honey, be live on the prison phone. 
I can just see it now. That's why I don't mess with them types. Virgo stretchy. Yeah, I had a Virgo boyfriend one time. Oh my God, but he was with you. He was strange. I mean, we just started dating really, and he called, it was around Christmas time and like early December. So we just say we started dating like early November or something. Because I remember it was Thanksgiving, and then, you know, Christmas came, and he was going to go home. To, he lived in D.C., and he was going to go home for Christmas, right? But then he couldn't afford it or whatever. And so um, I was at his house, and his mother called, and then he was talking to his mother, and he was talking about me. And I was in the next room, but I could hear him talking. Now, keep in mind, i only been dating this man for like a month and a half, six, seven weeks, something like that. And then he was telling his mother that he met somebody he wanted to bring home and all this old stuff here, making it sound like it was, you know, like a thing, we, you know, like, like something serious. And during that period of time, that was the furthest thing from my mind. That's when I was hanging out with my girlfriend who was a flight attendant and we was going everywhere all over the country partying. Just we would jump on a plane and go to Atlanta just for the weekend because we could do that. She worked for Continental Airlines. And so, you know, we was all over the place going to parties and just being stupid. And that was my lifestyle at that time. I had no intention of being in a relationship with nobody. I was just there for the D. That was it. That was the haul. And so when he said that, I was like, wow, well, let me get me some and then dip out on here. So I did dip, dip down. He was asleep. I got up, put my stuff on and left. And that was the last time I saw him. Never talked to him again. And he was called in the house. He was, you know, calling, calling. And I was like, oh, I just didn't want to be bothered. Yeah, I don't mess with Scorpios. I don't mess with Pisces. They whine too damn much. Oh, my God, the most emotional emotional men ever. I just cannot do it. No water signs for me. No, no, no. Really? Girl, that is too much Scorpio in one relationship. No. The Scorpio men are too possessive. Yeah, they be falling in love quick and stuff, but they want to own you. They want to control you. They just want, I don't like that. I want to go where I want to go and do what I want to do. So let me put this, um, hold on a second. Let me put this link up. If you want to share your story of being in love, you know, especially if you have something like, you know, how your fantasy of what love was versus the reality. Because I think a lot of us, you know, we grow up on those fairy stories, right? And you grow, you know, and you, in the end, it's like, oh, you know, the prince and his, you know, his steed and, oh, happily, you know, ever after and all this old stuff. Uh, Capricorns are interesting. They're usually very smart guys, but there's something of, they're so stiff. They're so stiff. I just, you know, so controlled and just so, I don't like that. I feel like I need to hit them over the head and make them just loosen up or something. They just, you know, want to just be just too controlled. I don't even know how to, how to put it. They're like very guarded or something. And it just makes me feel uncomfortable. And I just, you know, it's like they're they're always watching you and like, you know, judging you and, and trying to assess you and, you know, running this game on you or something. And every score, every Capricorn man I've ever met has been like that. You know, just they always like watching you and looking for some kind of way to, you know, get the best of you. Or I don't I don't even know how to put it, but it's just very uncomfortable. And so I don't mess with them. I don't. I don't do Capricorn men either. So, you know, it's just really hard as a Leo woman. You know, and it's like if you could get with a Leo man who has some sense, it's like the king and queen of the jungle. That's that's so bomb. That works. You at least you understand each other. But if he's the wrong kind of Leo, the kind of man who wants to, you know, run everything, then it is just never it just doesn't work. It doesn't work because, you know, you constantly feel like you fighting just. So you could just be yourself and they trying to control you and dominate you and all that, you know, which they're used to doing with other kinds of women. They don't work with a Leo woman. You can't run me. The man who could run me hasn't been born yet. Okay, even my daddy didn't do that. He tried to. And I said no. And that was that. I've always been my own person. I always do whatever the fuck I want to do. 
And so, you know, men, most men don't like that. They want you to do what they want you to do. And that's why I'm single. Oh, Lena, hold on a second. I forgot I got to put in my, my headphones so I can hear you. Hold on, girlfriend. We're going to hear what Lena got to say about love. I'm just running my mouth. Forgot all about this part. <laughs> okay, Lena, you can't speak. Hey, uh, hey, Auntie Deb, how are you? I'm fine. What's going this on? This is me, Uppity. I'm sorry, I had to go on my other phone, but this is me, Uppity Negro. Oh, okay. Hey. Hey. Okay, I'm so excited. I finally get to talk to you. I want to tell you how much you changed my life. Like, you don't know. I, I came in watching your pre-recorded videos, and I watched so many of them. I didn't even realize you was going live. I was just, like, going through your channels, um, just picking out d different videos about things I was currently going through. And even when I would, because I have my own personal therapist, but we only get 30 minutes. So when I would bring you up to her and I would just, she's like, I see such a difference in you. And I was like, yeah, I've been watching this lady call. Like, <laughs> she's like, if she is, uh, um, she would asked me if she, like, she, I was like, I don't know, but she should be, whatever. But <laughs> no, <laughs> but you know, I'll tell you the story behind that. I, I did study it. I studied it. But I realized once you take the test and get licensed, there's so much you can't do. If you stay unlicensed and just say, I'm, you know, I'm not licensed, I'm not a licensed therapist, you can do what you want to do. Smart. And so that's what, because I don't want people to be dependent on me, you know, like trying to come and see therapy for, you know, years and years. I want you to get in. I want you to get the lesson. I want you to change yourself and get, get on the road to being a better woman. That's what I want. That's what I want you to do. It sounds like that's what you did. And that's exactly what I did because now she yeah. see I use our therapy sessions differently. Now it's more to use as a sounding board as as much as like, oh, I'm just waiting to speak to my therapist to see how I get through this. Now it's more like, okay, this is this. I've been thinking about doing this. I already did this. I already did that. So should I do this and should I do that? And she's able to help me much better at that point too, especially since Excellent. we only have 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, really, that's the direction they should, you know, try to push people in is learning to make decisions in their best interest independently. And that's what I do. You know, I like I say, okay, let's walk through this. Let's think about this. What about this? What about that? Did you think about this? Did you think about that? Did you do this? Did you do that? What were you doing? What was your thought process? And then they tell me, then I correct it. And then they go. That's what we do. You know, that's what we do on the advice show. So good job. I yes. And I would tell everybody in the chat, recommend Auntie Deb to everybody you love because you don't love them. They don't know about Auntie Deb. OK. OK. We're now <laughs> back to the subject at hand. OK. okay. I, for my love, I, I noticed I did progress, but I noticed why I wasn't progressing on one certain thing. I seen and I didn't know what it was at the time. And so, like, I swear it's not this. is I. I I never met this lady. It wasn't until I got to her channel I realized I was dealing with narcissism. Because oh. I first got, I, I was able to upgrade the financial issues. I was able to do this and I was able to do that, but I kept going in certain circles and I couldn't figure it out. Like, what is it about me that's attracting these people? So, what I need to work on, I feel like right now, is um. O always got to work on saying less. That's just in my life in general. Stop giving them so much information that they use as ammo. I have to work on that when I'm in my feelings because because I'm new at this. So it's like, I'll be trying, I'll be trying. Then they get, after a while, all life problems get together. And then they they do that one thing and they trigger me and they get that big reaction like, oh, this is I'm waiting for. You know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. And I hate that because I can literally see the joy in his face when he gets it, you know? I don't know. <laughs> But like, so what I'm trying to work on is like how to apply your methods to other areas in life so that people that are in my love life or, well, well we have a child together. I'm trying to break away easy, but it's hard. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's but, difficult when you have a little, little kid. Yeah, she's only three and she has like, she's special needs with her, her glasses and everything. So it's like, I have to deal with him more than necessary because I don't work. I'm a stay at home mom. So it's like, that's, that's our issue. And right now I'm looking up stay at home jobs to work remotely. And I'm looking into tiny home living and stuff like that. Things I could do like that. But in the meantime, like, how can I just like stop other barriers? I'm like, like, cause now my, my daughter's in school now. 
So I have some free hours during the day, but it's not all day, you know. And but did you, you know, take they, a look at the video called "Control Your Emotions"? I may have to look that one up. That is a cornerstone video for this channel. That that unfortunately, yeah, that would have been what I would have recommended that you watch first, uh, because everything that I talk about is based on you having that kind of self control. You you got to master that first. And uh, controlling your emotions, you know, you won't get in your feelings. You won't let people take you there. You just look at them. You can have all your feelings later, you know, but you don't do it in a space where a person, especially a man that you're in a relationship with, can use that emotional ammo against you. Like, just like I'm talking to you right now, that's how I talk to me and I don't change my expression. They could be saying, oh, you effing bitch. And I'm going to have the same face. They say, oh, you're just the best, wonderfulest thing ever. I just, I'm so happy you came into my life. I'm going to still have the same face because I just want, I don't want them to feel like <laughs> what they say to me has any ability to, to control my emotions at all. And I know that might be kind of harsh, but that's how I do things. Okay. Thank you so much. That's what I wanted to know. Like I have to, I know that's what I have to work on. So I'm going to look up that video and thank you so much for your time. Love auntie Deb. All right. Okay. I'm going to try it so <laughs> sweet. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, you guys, um, anybody else who's new to the channel and you are having, you're struggling with your relationships, with your boundaries, with, you know, the things that she mentioned, you know, tell you too much information, being overly chatty, being overly reactionary to the things that men say to you, or even it could even be other women, coworkers, you know, the boss, whatever. Controlling your emotions and the self, that self level of self mastery, you've got to have it. You're going to be all emotional going through life. People are going to bat you around like a ping pong ball. You know why? Because they can. For no other reason. It's not like, you know, they're going to really. Uh, sometimes, and I'm, you know, and I hate to say this, but I do that too, but you can see like you got somebody's number, right? Then, I mean, this, the cat in me, the Leo, the cat part, you know how cats like to bat the little mouse and pounce at it and scare it half to death and just, you know, mess with it and stuff. They do all of that before they eat it, right? We're going to play with you. We're going to mess with you first. We're going to back you into the corner, then let you come out, then catch you again and corner you again. That's how cats do. And so when I come into a situation and I see somebody who's, you know, they react like a little scary mouse and be giving out all of them emotions, I just pull my claws out and I commence to toying with them for no other reason than I can. So you guys need to understand that. I know it sounds cold, but men do that exact same thing to women just because they can. It's terrible, but... It is what it is. Yeah, it's called Control Your Emotions. I'm not, you know, I didn't know that. Otherwise, I would have had the URL handy, handy to paste in there. But that is the title. Or, you know, Master Your Emotions, Control Your Emotions, something like that. But um, that's the title. So anyone, you guys want to um, share your story of, you know, how you were in love and it maybe didn't work, your expectations weren't met, it was a disaster, whatever. That is the link, just click that and then you can uh, join me here on the stage. In the meantime, let's go talk about this. Uh, wait, no, no, no. Okay, here we go. How to know if you love somebody. How to know if you love somebody. I'm gonna tell y'all a secret. My father told me that I had never been in love now, you know, keep in mind, I'm married at the time. I thought I, you know, I thought I loved him. I don't know, whatever. My daddy said, uh, no, nah, you ain't, you, you ain't in love. You don't never be in love. You ain't never been in love your whole life. I was like, oh my God, how could you say that? That's horrible for you to say that about your own child. And he's like, ha, he started laughing. And uh, yes, the poker player face, that's right. Uh, he started laughing and I said, why would you say that? Like I was all, you know, clutching my pearls and, and this was a long time ago, way before people used that phrase, but my hand was all up here and I was like, oh my God, you know, how could you say that? 
And he said that because I gave my men too much freedom. And I was like, what? He's like, you don't get jealous. I'm like, I sure don't. I don't. You know, I'm just thinking to myself, I don't care what they do. And my father was like, that's how, you know, he said that men, uh, I'm gonna tell, I'm, this is a conversation that I actually had with my daddy now. He says that men don't know what to do with that. They don't know what to do with all that freedom. They are used to women, you know, like chasing them down and, you know, hunting them up and calling them all the time and telling them what to do and all this old stuff. Now, see, I just, no, I'm not going to do all that. I can't be chasing you down because I'm too busy doing what I'm doing for me. Okay? You do what you're going to do. If I like what you do, then we'll, I'll continue to see you. The second I don't like what you do, I'm deuced out. And that's how I've always been my whole life. I deuced out on friends, do that on relationships. I just don't be tripping like that. I'm not trying to control nobody because I don't want nobody trying to control me. But he said, no, nah, you ain't been in love because, yeah, you don't get jealous and you're not possessive. And he said, this was a, this is a direct quote, because he said, if you was in love when that end reached for his coat, you would be reaching for yours, talking about where we going. He, this, this is, I will never forget he said that to me. Because I was looking at that man like I was, you know, like I was speechless. I just looked at him like with my mouth hanging open. And that's what he said to me. He was just <laughs> like it was the funniest thing ever. And I was horrified. I have never been jealous until one day. One, one, I was jealous one time in my life. And I thought I was going to die. I sweated out my curls. I had been to the hairdresser and stuff. I had my hair all curled and you know, blow dried and curled and stuff. And I was looking just way too cute. And I had on this skin tight spandex jumpsuit that was all risque and cleavage out, you know, tatas all out and back all out and stuff. I was just looking just a little cute thing. I'm flipping my hair. I'm just all, you know. And I had broke up with my later husband, right? I broke up with him because he pissed me off or something. And I broke up with him. I told him, leave me alone. And so we was at this Calvin Simmons Theater in Upland, right? But I was with somebody else. And in that whole theater, why did I, it's just like I felt this heat on the back of my neck. I turned around and in the next section in the front row, so you know how many rows it is. In the next section, we was in the front row. So all the seats on the ground floor, that he was in the front row of the next section over. He's sitting there with some girl all hugged up over him. And he's just stiff like a board, just stiff, just staring at, you know, because evidently he had seen me before I turned around to see him. And I just, I don't know, I just like, I couldn't breathe. I broke into a sweat. My scalp was all sweaty. My hair would start sticking to me. My little curls were just all limp. And I just, I, I couldn't breathe. I was like hyperventilating. It was terrible. Heart was racing. I thought I was going to die. So the dude I was with, I get jumped up. You know, my cousin said that. And all my pictures are in storage. I'll have to go in there one day and see if I can put my hands on them. Oh, I guess. You know, it was just too much. And so I went to the ladies' room. I'm trying to, you know, wipe myself and get myself together, put my makeup back on and stuff. And then when I came out, it probably was about 10 minutes later, um, he was gone. Him and the girl was gone. And then he had put a note in my mailbox apologizing saying you know he didn't want us to be apart and all this old stuff here and then i thought about how i felt i said oh shit maybe i'm in love now because <laughs> reflecting on what my dad said i was like oh no this was terrible i don't want to feel like that ever again and i didn't i haven't that was the one and only time but honey if that's what people feel when they get jealous uh oh what happened here Oh, shoot. Something happened to screen. My screen went black for a second. Anyway, yeah, if that's what people feel when they're jealous, I don't want no parts of that. I don't, I just, I don't want any parts of that. That's just not. You could kind of see, like, if you look at my early videos, I put some of links of them, like, on my new, um, not afraid of love. I said jealousy. Jealousy. That's different. 
But see, my father's version of in love included that possessiveness and jealousy. I don't really love like that. I love more with an open hand. You know, I mean, if you want to be in my life and in my hand and share love with me, my hand is open to you. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to reject you or nothing, but I'm not that type of person who clutches on to people, you know, clutches on to situations. I, you know, I'm fully aware that people choose to be with you or they choose not to. And I'm not going to beg you to love me. I'm not going to chase you down. I love like this. And I expect you to do the same. You welcome me into your life. I will be there. I welcome you into mine. Come on. This this right here. Open hand. You just put yourself right there. And you'll be in good, you'll be in good hands. I'm not going to fuck over you. But, um, you know, I'm not going to be that kind of possessive, controlling woman who goes through people's phones and stuff. I just, that, to me, it's just too undignified. I'm not going to do that. Never will. Never have. But yeah, I did think about my dad when that happened. I was like, oh, is this what he was talking about? But yeah, but he made me sick. That's why I fired his behind. Yeah, it's like, you know, and I say, you know, and the, the and I always leave the door open. So anytime a guy says, well, you know, I'm not really feeling this anymore. You know, I just think, you know, we probably be better with somebody. I mean, anything, anything. You don't even have to say that. Just I mean, just say you don't want, just say anything. I mean, whatever. Um, I'm I'm like, okay, you know, I, I'm not going to beg somebody and, you know, twist around and go through a whole bunch of changes. You don't want to be with me. I respect your decision. And I expect, you know, to ex respect mine. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of interesting. So anyway, let's look at this article here. This came from a website called marriage.com. How to know if you love someone. They have 30 signs to know if you love someone. Hmm. Yeah. It says you might feel like you're in love, but the feelings won't necessarily be love. Oh, yes, because a lot of people confuse lust with love. You know, that lust, honey. And then they get married and everything based on that lust. And then, you know, of course, at a certain point, lust is going to blow up. I mean, how many times you need to do it before that little itch is scratched? And then after that, you're like, oh, oh you start looking around and seeing what else is out there. OK, so how do you know if you love? OK, number one, they say, how do you know if you love someone? Number one, you keep staring at them. Well, shit, if that's the case, I'd be in love every time I go out downtown because the brothers be out the little italian boys i mean you know the little asian boy i'd just be looking at everybody everybody that's got a cute face and got that little beard i like or this thing that goes around here like that honey i'd be in love I'd be staring my eyes out does that mean i'm in love i'd be in temporary love with about 50 men a day because <laughs> i'll be staring i'm telling you i'll be like oh he is cute oh, wait but look at that one Oh, damn. Oh, my God. Where have you been on my life? Stuff like that. I just be talking shit. <laughs> so you stare at them, they say. You stare at them for a long time. That could be a sign that you're falling in love with them. I think it depends because I've stared at people, too. I stared at men that I've been on dates with. And you know what I was staring at? I was staring at them, looking at like the one dude I was staring at him because he had that cheese on his lip. Remember I told you about the dude? They were in at the Mexican restaurant and he was eating the enchiladas that had cheese on and he didn't use his napkin. And he had, you know how cheese is melty and it makes that string, right? So he had this string of cheese that was dripping down from his lip and he was talking and it was wiggling. <laughs> it was wiggling. And I was staring at him, but I was not staring because I was in love. I was staring wondering when he was going to wipe his face and get that strip of cheese off his face. <laughs> I was all like, <laughs> staring. <laughs> oh my God, that was so funny. And you know, sometimes you know you stare at men like you go on a date, right? Because you know, I go on. I'm the one date queen. I'd be on the one date, and that's it. And I'd be staring. I'm like this, right? And I'm looking at them while they're talking. I'm like, God, does he ever shut up? I know he couldn't possibly think that this is interesting conversation. 
he's talking about his job. I just want to pass out and roll on the floor and die. And I'm thinking this kind of stuff, right, to keep myself entertained. But I'm actually I'm staring at him and I'm like this. Hmm. 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 Mm hmm. Right. Wow. You know, making them kind of little sounds like that. But I'm staring at him. Does that mean I'm in love? Oh, the hell to the no. So, you know, guys are listening to this. If you got a woman standing at you and you talking and you never shut up, she's probably thinking, why does he shut up? Why is this a one? I feel like this is a lecture hall and not a date. Because, you know, conversation is supposed to be you talk, I talk, you talk, I talk, you talk, I talk. But with them, it's just they talk the whole time, just going on and on. You in love with Henry Cavill? Yeah, you be staring at him? Yes, honey. Yes. I was looking at some old Clint Eastwood movies. They had them on Tubi. You know, the good, bad, and the ugly, and hang them high. So, ooh, that motherfucker was so fine when he was young. He don't look like nothing now, but I think he was probably about 30, something, 35, 40 or something when he was making those movies. Cute. Very cute. And that attitude and that little cigar he's smoking, that little scowl he had. I was like, oh, my God, what happened? I guess I was too young when those movies was, you know, first out. I didn't really notice how handsome he was. But I was looking the other day. I was like, oh, damn, what happened? wait a minute. I was sleeping on this. Yeah, he definitely had swag. He had swag in his posture. And you know, I like a man who stands up tall. He's dead now? Well, shit. I, I don't know. Age happened. Yeah, but you know, yeah. And then, you know, some white people don't, don't age too well. Like, just, they age different. It's just, he just looked like really old. You know, and he was like mayor of some little Carmel, I think it was, for a while. Somebody said he's dead. Coffee Black said he was dead. He's not dead? Okay. I, was, I thought I would have heard about it. I mean, he's such a big star and an ex-mayor here in California. That's why I was like, well, when did he die? I didn't hear about that, but whatever. I did hear about Sidney Poitier, though. That movie, To Sir With Love. Oh, I cry every time I watch it. Okay, let me get back on topic. I'm talking about it. He's not dead. Okay. He's looking dead. Shut up. <laughs> you know what? You guys are out of control. Okay, let's talk about this. Okay, so point one is you stare at them a lot. Point two, you wake up and you go to bed with thoughts of them. Huh. You think about the first. Okay, but what's the difference between that and obsession? Because someone who's obsessed would do that too. Talkaholic who girl, yes. Oh my God, they just never shut up. And they had a nerve to talk about women. Be talking a lot. Oh no. Men can out talk women like 20 times to one. They just be, and they be talking about nothing. They don't nobody want to hear about all that. That's people that used to play sports that ain't nobody ever heard of. But did you know, in 1940, he was a star baseball player and he did this and that. And I'm like, okay, how are you getting some money for knowing that? How's that benefiting your life or mine? And then they just look at you. I just thought it was interesting. Okay, well, you thought that all by yourself. So then they know after that, don't talk to me about that stuff. Oh, his son looks like him. Well, we're going to have to look him up. Where is, where is you at? Maybe they can do a remake with starring the sun. That would be good. Yeah, they won't shut up. And they always talking about some stupid shit. Just stupid. Okay, so you go to bed and wake up with thoughts of them. Okay, number three, you 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 feel high. Oh, that must be the dopamine that they were talking about in the other article. Um, a study trying to assess the similarities between drug addiction and romantic love found that there are many similarities between the early stage of romantic love and drug addiction. Wow. Hmm. Number four, you think about someone too often. When you love someone, no doubt you will not stop thinking about them. Hmm. I don't know. I'd be too busy thinking about myself. Number five, you always want to see them happy. 
I mean, I guess that's better than seeing them sad, but aren't they responsible for their own happiness? Don't put that burden on me. Number six, you are stressed of late. In most cases, love will be associated with fuzzy feelings, but once in a while, you will find yourself stressed. Hmm, stress is normal in a relationship. Number seven, you feel some jealousy. Mm -hmm. Even though you might not be a jealous person in general, hmm, being in love with someone makes you want to have them for yourself exclusively. Number eight, you prioritize them over other activities. Yeah, like some people who won't even go to work because they want to be up under their beloved. Then they get fired. And then they beloved have to take care of them. No, to get your ass up and go to work. I'll see you later. Number 10, time flies when you are with them. Have you spent the weekend together and you wake up Monday morning thinking, oh, how did two days go by? Number 11, you empathize with them. Number 12, you, oh, what happened to number 12? Oh, I guess I cut it off. Oh, you want them to be a you you mean you want them to become a better version of themselves? Number 13, you love their quirks. You know the best example of I saw a movie with Robin Williams in it, Good Will Hunting, when he was doing a session with uh the character that Matt Damon played, and he was talking about his deceased wife. And he was talking about her quirks, like, you know, little little ticks and little weird things that she did and everything. But, you know, he was married to the woman. He knew all her all her little foibles. And uh, he was trying to explain to Matt, who was, you know, with this girl, and he was trying to figure out if he loved her or not. And he was trying to explain to him that, you know, when you truly love someone, all of those little things are part of who they are. And you take those things and whatever else that comes with them all as a package. And so, you know, he the way he was the way he said it though was just so excellent. I mean, really good acting and really good portrayal of a man who missed everything about his wife. All the little things that people don't even usually think about, he was relating that he missed about her and that was just so, you know, I'm sincere going <laughs> Because it was it was just beautiful to see that you saw that, but think about that part though. Um, that part is the is man. It was just unbelievable. So um, yeah, you love their quirks. That's a good example of that. Number fourteen, you can imagine a future together. Number fifteen, you crave their you know physical closeness with that person. You know you want to be. Um, up under them. Number 16, being with them feels easy. And that's, you know, it should be because, you know, if you had to kind of love that struggle love where you got to be going through a whole bunch of changes and feeling all messed up and stuff, that doesn't work. Oh, we got a caller. Mr. Business Suits. Are you going to talk about love? You have to unmute your mic. Well, let me know when you're ready. All right. Number 16, being with them feels easy. Okay. And number 17, you want to spend the maximum amount of time with them that you can. When you fall in love, one of the greatest answers to how to know if you love someone is when you want to spend plenty of time with them and it never seems to be enough. Number 18, you wish them happiness. Number 19, you don't hold grudges. Number 20, you're okay being yourself in front of them. Number 21, you feel the urge to say, I love you. Number 22, you feel ready for commitment. Number 23, you feel their pain. Yeah, you could do that with a, even a good friend. You know, when they're hurting, you hurt. That, you know, a lot of this is, you know, anyone, because, you know, like a good friend, you want to be around them too. Because you guys have fun together. That person gets you. You know, it doesn't always have to be, um, you know, a romantic partner. Number 24, you behave affectionately around them. So you women who have men that don't ever want to hold your hand, don't want to put their arm around you, don't ever want to sit you on their lap and kiss and cuddle you and 
oogie goo 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 ga ga with you. He won't put his head on your lap and stuff voluntarily without you asking him. Play footsie, all that kind of stuff. You don't. You have a man who won't. You know he doesn't come up to you and give you spontaneous hugs and kisses. Only when it's time for some action. You have somebody like that. You know, I would doubt very much that he loved me. I, it would feel very transactional. And it would feel like he was there and like it was a relationship of convenience or something. You know, he's only there for what he's going to get out of me. That wouldn't work for me. I want you to, like I said, you're going to either be all in or all out. I don't do the impartial things. Number 25, you wait for his text. 26, you feel safe with him. That's important. Emotional and physical safety. Number 28, his opinion would matter to you. Number 29, almost everything reminds you of them. Wow. If you're having coffee, you will think about having coffee with them and the time that you had coffee with them or whatever. And number 30, the last one, you feel comfortable making sacrifices. You're ready to make adjustments for them and a few sacrifices to make them happy. It doesn't really bother you and it doesn't feel like a burden. You're okay taking care of them and making them feel happy with slight compromises. Hmm. So that's it. You know, that's it for that. How do you guys know when you're in love? What does love mean to you? What do you do? Yeah, my husband was a Taurus and he was very affectionate. That was that was wonderful. That worked for me. And I was the same with him. He liked to just you know, be hugged and rubbed and petted on and stuff all the time. Sometimes he would piss me off though and be like, I'm touching your ass, you got cooties. Get away from me. Okay, there we go. That's the that's where if you want to talk, you want to share your story. You want to talk about a love that went sideways. You want to talk about how you have changed how you love. Anything that you want to share about love, I'm all ears. There's the link in the chat room. Just click it and um, and unmute your mic and you can start talking. I would love to hear what you guys have to say. Because, you know, everybody's got some some history. I can't be the only one. You know, with knuckleheads galore in my life and some, you know, interesting people that did some crazy stuff that I just didn't appreciate. I told you about, about the dude I was dating right at the time when my dad died. And he thought I was going to give him, I, he thought I was going to give him $5,000 from the money that I got from my father, you know, insurance or whatever, inheritance. He, you know, he had had a baby by a white girl and she took off and went to the East Coast and took the kid with her and didn't want to be bothered with him, right? And so I'm looking at that. I'm like, okay, what did you do to her? Well, I didn't do nothing, he claimed. I said, no, nah, you had to have done something because that's not normal. You know, and a woman's going to go to the opposite side of the country just because there's something you did or said that either scared her, you threatened her, there's something wrong. That's why she went and disappeared on you. So he was going to get an attorney so they could hire an investigator so he could get, you know, find out where his kid is. I said, yeah, but you realize once they find a kid, you're going to have to start paying child support, right? And he didn't like that part. But he still, you know, he found an attorney and he was like, oh, I found an attorney. I said, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> and so then he's like, you know, but he wants a $5,000 retainer. I'm like, $5,000? That's a lot of money. And so then he was staring at me, right? So, you know, it slowly started dawning on me that he stared at me when we talking about $5,000. What's he staring at me for? So I'm looking at him and I say, um, so where are you going to get $5,000 from? That's a lot of money. Well, I thought that you could give it to me. I said, you thought that I could give you $5,000. Pray do tell where that thought came from. And he's like, well, because, you know, I know that your dad just died. And you're going to get an inheritance. And so I thought you could give me $5,000 from them from that. I said, think again. I'm not giving you shit. You tripping. And then I told him, give me the girl. You know, where's the girl's the girl's name? I'm going to find her. And then I'm going to tell her to go into hiding more. And that if she gets child support, to get to ask for child support to get double from your ass. That's what I'm going to tell her. 
I'm going to tell her everything. I'm going to tell her where you live, where you work. I'm going to tell her everything so she can tap that ass. And so then he was like, why would you do that? I said, because the negacity of you to come and come at me like that, you was tripping. So I just told him all kind of stuff off. And then he decided that I was not on his team, which I never told him I was anyway. Again, I'm just there for the D. Okay, that's it. I don't care about your problems, your baby mama, your child support. No, I don't really care. But now you're going to try to play me? Oh, let me show you how to, how to do it, son. I'm going to have her tapped into your pocket for the next 20 years. Because the two years when you didn't pay, oh, you're going to have to pay rearages. Because I'm going to tell it, I'm going to sing like a canary. Yeah. Oh, Tori. Let me get Tori on here. Tori's going to tell us about love. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. What's up, girl? Oh, my God. Deborah Cooper, the queen. I love you. I love you to a thousand pieces. I just got to get it out. Like, oh my, my heart. God. I, li I literally want to cry because you just truly helped me. Uh, I'm 35. I dismantled the patriarchal system that the software that was downloaded in my mind. But um, my sister, I have two stories. Number okay, one, here. girl, let me tell you, listen, I'm going to spill the tea. I do not care. Like, OK, the first time I was like 22, you know, I went to uh, I was an undergrad and I met this man. He was grown as hell, you know, got a job, all that. He fly to me, flew to me out every state. What you want to do? Oh. I was so in love because I'm like, oh, he has a good job, girl. He got money. He give me whatever he want. That nignog end up being married. Oh, married. No. Huh? I said, no, he wasn't. He lied to me. Yes, dead ass. And then I was like, you know, I'm like a Christian girl. And I was like, oh, Jesus, please help me, Lord. Um, I, I need to know the truth about this gentleman. And then this one first book came out when Facebook first came out around 04. And I said, oh, I need to use your work laptop for something. And I did. I really did because I was in sales myself at that time, even in undergrad. And it clicked right on his page. He said that he was single, but the wife said that she married. And so I sat on it for a few weeks because he like, oh, we going to be in the penthouse at the Bellagio. You ready, baby? I'm like, hell yeah, I'm ready. Let's go. I'm just, you know, just being dumb. OK. <laughs> yes, honey. I was so ready. I, he, man, that money had me so blinded. And then I asked him at the Bellagio. I was like, who's this? And he was like, oh, oh, what you talking about? So anyway, with that story, I'm like, I just I was so entangled. And then I went back and I opened up my own business in my hometown. And my grandma, when she was alive, she looked at me. She looked at the light skinned Nick Nog next door. She said, Victoria, you better not get with your neighbor. I said, OK, grandma. Guess what? I end up oh, getting no. with my neighbor. Our stores were literally next door to each other. It was the worst. And God had convicted me because I literally put this man like he was a God to me. Like this is what happens when you don't have male influence and fathers in your life. You make the first man you fall in love with an actual God. And then they mismanage, you know, your expectations. It was just terrible, honey. I was crying every day. I'm asking all the angels, goddesses, guys, and fairies to get this pain off of me. I'm like, oh, Lord. And, but then I prayed again. I said, okay, Jesus, I am so sorry, God. I didn't know. And then he was like, now nah, you see, it, it's not that you love that person. He just mirrored your own issues. You got abandonment issues. And, and so how am I going to send you somebody and you don't even know what love is yet? Because you got to deal with all the abandonment issues and stuff like that. And then um, after that, uh, a, a quote came to me and it said that the final form of love is forgiveness. So that's when I was able to like get over it because at first I was so in love. And blah, blah, blah. I'm going to tell you right now, your girl been single ever since. I've been single ever since. And I'm so glad I kept my little coochie to myself because these niggas is mad crazy. Like, oh, my God, they will really lie to you. If you don't know about narcissism and you a little church girl, I was literally fooled out here. I was fooled yeah. out here. Oh my That's God. The unfortunate part because they're trying to keep you 
you know, the teachings are so opposite. They want to keep you away from, quote, worldly, you know, things. Okay, that's fine if that's, the, you know, everybody that you meet is a, that same kind of person. But you go out here in the world, these folks ain't church. Oh, no. no. You they are like a little lamb here. being led to slaughter. I really was. I was slaughtered so much. And it took me oh, so much terrible. inner work not to be, like, bitter. Like, I literally want to cry now. But then you look at these guys, you're like, it it it, it really does. Because I, I listen to a lot of people, and I really appreciate your authenticity. Because a lot of other, uh, quote, unquote, experts, which they're not, they're just bitter women, they they leave out the, the authenticity, right? They leave out their part in the story, or they try to make it seem one way, and it's really not like that. And what's special about you is that you give, like, real-life scenarios and it's unfiltered like sometimes women want to give you advice but then still remain like a lady like they don't want to tell you like girl let me tell you you messing with him your ass gonna be bent up get the deal leave get the bread get the head and leave <laughs> they don't tell you that they still want to be a lady they still want to act like you know it's all good no we need the raw truth like you help me like with my nieces so I, i'm getting them ready at like 10 because their fathers are in their lives. So I think they're going to attract a lot of narcissists because they're going to have money. They are already 12 years old with Gucci bags and all that. So I don't want no little poor little uh, nig knocks trying to get up on my nieces. But for me, definitely. And men hate that. They hate the fact that you're a strong woman. They can't stand it. When I was with that guy, he ended up yep. being married. That nigga chased me all over the globe. I was running from his ass because he needed a good fool. Like they will, they won't let you go when, when, when you think you're in love and they know you stupid, they need a good fool. Like they like, no, I can't let my dummy go. I don't. And, and then God was told me like, oh, the reason why some men cheat is either because they're a coward or they're greedy. And, and yeah. the spirit of greed can really take over a lot of men and they don't know you know what to do. But yes, girl, I thought I was in love, honey. I'm cooking. Oh, Listen, I don't cook or clean. I'm cooking. I'm cleaning up the house. I'm like, people looking at me like, are you okay? What's going on? I'm like, okay, trying to please these niggas. No, I'm cooking. I'm cleaning. I'm bending over. Um, I'm, I never denied him sex, anything. I'm dead ass tired. I got to get up at 4 a.m. Because he feeling all froggish. I'm like, man, this shit's stupid. And then it's so funny. Once you find yourself as a full woman, and you really don't need anybody and you're not defined by society standards. It's amazing how many people flock to you after that. They're like, oh, she don't need me. It's like, damn, I don't even like you niggas anymore. Why is y'all still trying to find? Like, leave me alone. I want to be in the forest. I want to listen to Deborah the Cooper. Forest. I want to eat my... Okay, Bambi. I, <laughs> yes, I do. I really do. I listen to that. De- I mean, religiously, I put me a little playlist. That's my church. Like, they need to add the book of Deborah. I don't care what well, nobody that's just what like we, that that's, guy. That's you saying that that's what we call it. Yes, <laughs> we need the book of Deborah. We need it. We need to have you everywhere. You just an incident master. Every woman, you, they need to have on a chastity belt until they listen to Deborah Cooper. I'm going to sit my nieces in the room like my grandma used to sit me in the room and read the Bible. Like, nope, you got to do a 20 page thesis on Deborah Cooper. If you can't do that, then you can't go outside and play. <laughs> You can't play. Well, you know, by the time somebody could do that, they would have listened to enough. They should know. They should have a pretty good idea how to, you know, assess a knucklehead and move him out of the way. They should be able to do that. That might not be a bad idea, actually. No, really. I really want to write a thesis. The thing is, too, is like every woman not ready, though. It's so amazing about how many people are still defined by, oh, I'm not like married women. They feel like it's their own secret sorority and they treat their husbands as the new Chanel bag. Like, oh, I got a man. You know, I'm like, hell no, I got no man. So I love my coochie to myself. I like doing what I want. I love to get my experiences and I go home, get that bread, get that head, then leave, go ahead. I don't care. I don't want to hear it. I don't have time for it. Like, you want that headache? You could go ahead and have it because I'm over here with Deborah Cooper. She is my everything. <laughs> I, 
you know, you, I know you shouldn't put people on a pedestal, but it's so important that you get like all the glory and stuff like that. But I must admit, Miss Cooper, I am selfish sometimes, right? I want to keep you to myself. I know you, it's like, oh, you should tell everybody, like uh, the young lady said earlier, but it's like, no, I want to keep her to myself. She's my special little teddy bear. I don't want anybody to know. <laughs> I'm getting all these jewels. I'm going to leave on. <laughs> I do. I just want to keep you to myself because it's just like so special to me. I don't want anybody to know, but I really, really appreciate you. I love you, love you, love you. And also, one thing you also made me realize, because I also have older customers and friends and stuff like that, like in their 70s, especially with women. And I have my auntie, if I'm 35, my auntie's like 60 or 70. It's like how men are threatened. Oh, you're going to die alone and all this stuff. Oh, yeah. But if women band together, it's like, I'm never going to let my auntie or any other single woman, especially a woman of color, be in suffering. When my grandmother died, all the ladies in the family was there every day. My sisters are doctors. We was on it. We banded up. And that's the only thing I think men have on us is that we have this fear of death that, oh, we're going to die alone. And we need them to, we need somebody to watch us die. Like they could do anything about Please. it. The, uh, them, <laughs> them will make you die faster because they suck all the juice out of you. Drain your energy, make you stressed and tired and stuff. Yes. Yeah. So all I women just, that, the women the, the, the women out live, you got the old folks home, the women be in there. There's not men in those things. And the women be walking around healthy. The men be like with one leg and cut off from their diabetes and whatnot, in wheelchairs and whatnot, looking a hot mess. No. Oh my God, that's hilarious. <laughs> It's yes, no, I was a relative. relative. I bet you they'll tell you that she they, does. They My are. sister, she says the craziest stories, but definitely that makes me also want to take care of all the women around me so they won't feel like that. Like, oh, you got to be all uh, go through suffering and pain just to be with a man, this mere mortal. Like, what is it like? I just need you to just, you know, if 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 I'm feeling a little froggish, leap. But other than that, it's like I'm really kind of done. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm oh, over yeah, it. There's more and more women feeling that exact way. But I need to. I got another caller, so she should okay. have a turn too. I but love I definitely you. Definitely have enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. I love you. You made me really laugh. It was so funny. <laughs> okay, bye bye. Okay, let's get um. Earth girl on here. Earth girl, your turn. Hi. Hi, Ms. Deborah. How are you? I am fine. That's good. Nice to see you and to hear you. Yes, yeah, same too. Likewise, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to call in because I feel like I am a weird phenomenon in the sense that I know there's a lot of female girls, young lady into young adulthood, who's kind of are in the shadows, who are dealt with this, but are not like, don't have the knowledge or the awareness into oh, life. Oh, what, you're getting ready to tell me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So they just get lost in the sauce, basically. Okay. So I, I've been naive throughout dating, throughout relationship, just a guy tell me something, I just believe it like a sucker. <laughs> um, just trusting. I have like this nature about me where I'm just like, well, if I treat you this way, you're gonna treat me that way. Cause everybody was like, you know, um, everybody is cool and everybody is nice. So taking that mindset into uh dating was a disaster. Yeah. for me and what made it even more disaster was just no guidance so it was literally like shooting in the dark even to the point where I had a conversation with my mother I said mom you know I'm with this guy I'm not happy she's like but you told me you was gonna marry him she didn't even hear that I said I'm not happy right the focus was on the fact that I told her that I was gonna marry. So I'm just giving you a background of like the type of mother <laughs> that I oh, was. That's a, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, cause I usually try to put myself in somebody's, you know, I try to mm -hmm. figure out why they said what they said, what's going on. Mm -hmm. I'm drawing a blank on that one. Yes. Okay. So um, now the story. 
this is a recent one. I thought, like, I stay single for three years, right? Okay. I say I'm going to read some stuff. I'm going to learn about relationship because I'm really lost. I don't know what I'm doing. So still single. I felt like I did all this work, went into dating, went online dating. Okay. Just knew, okay, I just want to meet a nice guy, somebody I can talk to, somebody that has a career because I have a career. They don't have to be making a lot of money. Uh, I just want a decent, nice human being. So guy approached that? Yeah, so a guy approached me. We're talking online. He says, yes, I work for, you know, New York MTA because we live in New York. And I have my little side company doing IT tech stuff. And, uh, you know, I want to get to know you. So I said, okay, sure. We start, uh, we go on the first date. We start dating. And doing this process at the time, there's a, a lot of, like, hot and cold that's happening. Like those texting every day. I love you. And I want to get to you. And I'm just like, but you don't know me like that. Why do you say you love me? Like we just started talking. How, and, but I'm not aware this is like a setup type of thing mm -hmm. he does. Right. Um, and then when he doesn't call me, I feel like this withdrawal. Like I have to call this guy and talk to him. Why is he not talking to me? Did I do something wrong? Did I say something wrong? And then you start questioning yourself. So anyway, he's like, you know what? I'm going to finally, he finally sets a date. We go on another date. And he's like, we should just okay, move. what's the time frame between these two dates? Literally two weeks. Oh, hell no. Okay. Okay. Literally two weeks. Moving together like a month. Okay. He wanted you to move in? No, he moved in with me. In like oh, a month. A homosexual. Okay. A homosexual. Okay. So the 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 plan he came to me with was um you know i want to move in with you i have my business is doing really well like i could buy a house for cash in new york and we'll be able to get married in a couple of months and i'm like okay a man with a plan that sounds nice finally the guy that says he knows what he wants and this is what he wants to do so i'm more like no detail no question about where this money is coming from, how I just met this person, just like totally excited. Call my friends, tell them I met this guy, he's great, he's moving in with me, and we're going to be looking for a house and getting married, all this other stuff, right? So then I said to him, when are we going to see the finance records that, you know, you have this money in account? He's like, well, I have to talk to my accountant. They're a little busy right now, but I'll get back to you on the paperwork end. So I said, okay. Then I start looking. I'm like, all right, let's talk to a realtor person. Since you said we could, you know, get a house. He's like, okay. So we start going on house hunting, literally with the realtor, looking at houses, doing all of this stuff. COVID hits like a month or so later. COVID hits. And now it's like, oh, I can't get to my account. My business is going down. And then he'll like say, oh, he have a Zoom meeting with this company. It was just so much like pushing it off. Don't bring paperwork, bring paperwork. In between that, he uh, has a whole freaking mental breakdown. No lot of debts. So now I'm like, oh, gosh, I'm a caregiver. I could do this. You you had a terrible childhood and and and, oh, girl, and no. for you. Oh, I could get you a therapist. Sign up with the therapist with my credit card. Right? I'm like, let's get you the services you need so you can be better. And and I help people in my life. I help all my friends. So I don't see a problem with me helping you. Like, it's not a problem with that. Help him get to the therapist, start talking to the therapy, and he's like, I'm fine, everything is fine. And, Little by little, I'm just like, I think I found myself in a web that I did not know how to get out of. Because I'm like, okay, I'm working doing COVID because I'm a central worker. I'm handling all that comes with my life. And then here comes this other burden that feels like I just got another child on top of it. Exactly. 
And going through, I mean, it was like breakup, makeup, breakup, break. And then the 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 mind game that would play doing the breakup was just like, you're just like everybody else. They said they was gonna come into my life and help me, and they leave me. And then this guilt just freaking sits on my chest. No, like I don't know. I think Miss that as I'm in therapy right now, it comes from my mom and my like always being responsible for somebody else and always feeling like I have to put myself down in order to lift wow. another Are you person. The I am not the oldest, but I am the sensible of all of them. It's kind of like the everybody above me are just like in their own world. So I am the reliable child. I'm the one okay. who gets the call when everything goes wrong and the money is needed and, and things like that, right? So doing this process, I'm learning about his mental health and all that's going on. I start freaking out because then I'm getting my own mental health issues where I'm starting having anxiety. Like, how did you get this? How did you end up with this guy? What's going on with your life? This, that, and the third. Finally broke up with him. Find out I was having a baby, okay? Yes. So then this is when it's like, it's serious for me. Cause I'm like, oh my God, there's a child coming into this world. I start then being serious about like asking questions, like getting information, like send me this, who, you know, give me this. And it was just like, excuse, excuse, excuse. And I finally made the decision. I think seven months later, I was like, you know what? Uh, I'm deciding to keep the baby. Wow. Uh-oh, what happened? What happened to my sound? Can't hear her. Oh. Let me check the audio. Yeah. Okay, my sound's all right. Something must be going on on your end, girlfriend can't hear you okay I'm gonna mute your mic while we while you figure that out let me get Kiki on here what's your story Kiki oh I just had a uh, some questions are you answering questions um, no well people are telling they're sharing their stories about love and how they made mistakes you know what they're figuring out um, about well how they are when they fall in love and you know, okay. Um, I've never, that. I've never, I've never been in love, but I've, I've seen it. So can I tell those a, a couple of those yeah. examples then? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I was with, okay. Uh, I was with a guy, um, we were just uh, hanging out as friends, but we, he was consistent as far as, well, no, I remember somebody was saying, um, you know, with, uh, I, she told me to stand up for myself as far as when a guy say, uh, well, I just, when I'm in your area, I just pick you up. And, and I was like, no, are you going to plan it? Tell me the time and date. And he was like, oh, okay. And then when I, when he did that and he actually came and told me the time he's going to pick up that he was really into me. We would hang out, talk through the week. We would just hang out on weekends, but we did all kinds of stuff. But then I remember I was with him in a car. He re reconnected with, with like an old coworker and, um, and I just thought, well, they, they, you know, they had talked on the phone, but we talked, but we actually hung out. But with her is he would like come over like where her apartment complex is and just sit outside. I found out that even though me and the guy, we were hanging out, going to all these really cool places. He always paid us. You know, he was more into her because I found out they didn't hang out. He would actually he was working at UPS at the time. This man was going on four hours to five hours sleep almost every night just to go over to her apartment complex and sit like where the little, the playground is or the bench just to talk to her. And wow. I was like, Oh my God, that, I just thought that was amazing. And I was like, wow, I just, and they never hung, hung out to any place. And I was like, wow, but I said that he must really be in her to actually sacrifice. Cause, uh, cause it, once he could bring the truck in, he still goes out and work even more. So to the point that when he go and talk to her, he would wind up, it'd be like four to five hours of sleep that he would get every night going to go uh, talk to her after he get off from uh, working those long shifts at UPS. Wow. Uh, yeah, so that was kind of like an example. And I have another example uh, when I was with an uh, ex. 
it was it was bad but um i was we were still at a small church so i saw and heard everything he was with the uh the, the new lady and uh and I, uh, unfortunately i was looking for a while and i and i think that uh, a gift that he got me that was just uh it was an exchange of gift he just gave me a gift just because the only gift he ever got me was a bag of doritos and it was at the beam this man <laughs> It's funny as uh, it's funny as it, but it's so sad at the same time. But it was like a I, I'm like I like to receive gifts, but it's like we only exchange gifts. But but I, uh, and that was after being here for years, and then found out with this lady that uh that he was in love with. He the first week he spent like three hundred dollars on kids' clothes for her kids' uniforms and school supplies. Wow, I was yeah, like. Was and went and cut her grass and all, all kind of stuff. And I was like, I was like, what in the world? I was because I was like, because I always thought he was cheap. I just thought he was, you know, I saw like, oh, he's just a cheap. He said he never had money. I mean, we even got into it over a couple of dollars before. And I was like, oh, he's just a cheap. I just took it as a cheap guy because I had like cheap uncles and stuff. But I was like, oh, he just wasn't feeling me all the time. Because I said, he I said, where he get the $300 from? So that was kind of like my little you know, kind of understanding and then also from college, just because you on the phone with somebody fall asleep on the phone, all that doesn't mean they in love with you. You know, oh. that's, a, that's another thing. Young ladies, you can call y'all fall asleep on the phone and all that. And we had good time. And we had a great summer, but as soon as that summer end, I was discussing with him, maybe I should transfer to a school closer to, to him or something like that. And we was looking at apartments. He was doing the whole scam, acting like we looking at apartments. Stuff. And then when I went back to go, Visit a relative, something like he just ghosted, yeah, you know, he got n- nothing. He realized he, he got in too deep, yeah, yeah. So that's that's another thing I just want to let uh the, the college younger girls know, okay. okay. Thanks, Kiki. Thank you. All right, bye bye. Bye, okay. Uh, Earth Girl is back, okay. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I don't. Like, it's bad. Uh, you're in the backstage as I was talking. I don't know what happened. It just took me. Oh, back I didn't see you here. Oh, all right. okay. I wonder what that means. I don't know. You know, I haven't been using this platform all that long, so there's still things I don't know, and I guess that's a new one. Yeah, I understand. Okay. Okay. So let's see where we left off. You found out you were pregnant. I found out I was pregnant. Um, at first, I kind of just dealt with it by myself. And um, I wanted to have the baby. So I approached him and I asked him, you know, the way I feel like you're going about everything, you keep saying this is going to happen and this is going to happen, but it never happened. The only thing I can say I was terrified to do was she was like, I want to marry you. Let's go forward with the wedding and go to city hall and all this other stuff. I started having like literal panic attack and I like something was just like, don't do it. Don't do it. This is a trap. So I, I didn't do that. I said to him, I'm, I, I'm not able to do the marriage. I just don't feel comfortable. Like I couldn't even find the words. All I knew was it doesn't feel right to me. That that's literally. Oh, I'm so all. glad you listened to yourself. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the only thing I, I felt comfortable, like connecting to the emotion. Cause it was just so much emotion going through me that time. Anyway, um, he's like, I'll take care of mine. So I said, so, like, I guess, you know, having a baby coming in will really clear off your sinuses and your, your brain cells. And I'm like, so what's the plan? What does it look like? Like, I need detail. And it was just like, I took care of mine. So I was like, you're not being serious right now. So this is what I'm going to do. You come back to me in three weeks, come up with the proposal, come up with your account, a plan, and all of this other stuff. Three weeks pass. He's like, I'm not feeling well. I'm not coming. I said, you're not serious about life. And I feel like I just made the biggest freaking mistake of my life right now. And I'm going to go cry and I'm going to come back and I'm going to let you know. So I said to him, I came back and made my decision. Literally went over my budget. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Went over my budget, said, okay, this is how I'm going to raise this kid. How much money do I need up front, you know, for my care, my need, my I have my private insurance, all this other stuff. Listed everything, right? And then made a decision, okay, I'm going to be able to do this. This is what I'm going to do, regardless of what it is. He said, let's see what he says. Didn't say nothing. All kept saying is, I can, I, I took care of mine. So I said, listen, see me in court, okay? 
if you want any parts of this child life and you have to prove to me that your mental health is well because i have like several videos when i tell you Deb, of this man just freaking out like completely out of his mind because somehow a lot that i mean not you but me mm -hmm. that i would never have his child because yeah. mental illness is genetic mm -hmm. definitely I would, yeah. you know that I just that i would have looked at that and said okay you got a cray gene and my kids gonna have no cray gene nah <laughs> we can't do that that's, I mean, that's how I think when I mm -hmm. have these mental problems. Yeah. I cannot. I can definitely see that because I'm pro choice. That's the reason why I couldn't make that decision. Like, just, just my experience in life and what I've seen, I've dealt with several people who've gone through uh, abortions. I've had a neighbor who literally went back door and dated and died. So a lot of those early experience has stuck with me because of that. And um and I was just like, I can't do it. I will I will beg on the street before I do it. Like that's literally how strong I was. And when I said that to myself, I was probably like 14. So oh, wow. yeah, so that that's always been um like something I'm not gonna do. So anyway, now uh he calls once a week. Oh, I thought you were different compared to other female. Like, I want to have access to you and I could just show up. I'm like, no, go to court. See me in court. Has yet to make the effort. Matter of fact, doesn't even call to say, how was it? How are you feeding? How is diaper? Absolutely nothing. It's always, uh, how could you do this to me? And, um, and I thought you were different. And I, I almost... As he says that, I think he really thought you was a sucker. Like he was going to have you on the hook forever. Like some part of you was never going to wake up and be aware of this situation. Like he was going to have you be another child plus having another child on you right. at the same time. And take care of everybody. And All take care of everybody. And, 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 and I'm telling you, Miss Depp, if it wasn't for me like literally crying and breaking down, I wouldn't have seen the pattern that I created. I wouldn't have seen because I've always been accessible to everybody else and been that dependable friend um, and, and gone out of my way to do for so many people. I wouldn't see how I was putting myself down consistently. I wouldn't see the narcissistic pattern because that's really what he was. And, and, and because I knew the truth, like, you know, his trauma and everything that happened, it, and when I listened to narcissistic, like, lecture and stuff like that, I was just like, oh, my God, yes, yes. Like, it was literally oh, yeah. like a blueprint. It mm -hmm. was the experience was just hitting it. And I knew, oh, yeah, you need help, too. So you don't attract this stuff again. Like, you need to go sit with somebody and really break it down. And it took me, like, saying, okay, this is the trauma home I grew up in completely raising myself i mean like a seven years old completely raising myself um just because there were so many trauma and things being around me i chose as a child to focus on the good the good in everybody it was almost like a protective mechanism as a kid but then became a detriment to me as an adult because right. i was unable to see that Right. I was just like, everybody's good. Everybody's great. And that's just the recent relationship I'm talking about, Miss Deb. I even talk about like the seven years I had a mother-in-law and a father-in-law live with me before that. Okay. <laughs> yes. So. Oh, no. Mine couldn't even spend the weekend. You can't stay here. You need to be in a hotel. Child. <laughs> okay. Um, so it, it got crazy. Early me was just like, oh, cry and just let it go. This version of myself where I'm able to like really see and really break down and sit with the therapist. I mean, I've been in therapy like eight months now, plus you. 
and really like learning how to meditate and quiet my mind and listen to what my body is saying to me if something don't feel right. Learning how to say no. I've learned how to say, I never could say no before Miss Deb without feeling guilty. Without like you know, feeling like I'm gonna hurt somebody else's feeling. They feel guilty. And I I don't yeah. you know, I try to, you know, I try to empathize with people. I don't, you know, try to blame you. I am not doing I'm not into that. I just um I never feel guilty about anything. And I was going to share that with you. You know why? Mm -hmm. Everything that I do, I chose to do it. I meant to do it. If I say no to you, I said no because that was good for me to say no to you. You have every right to ask me. I'm not going to, I can never tell people what they cannot ask me or, you know, whatever. But I have every right to think about, is that going to be like too much for me? Just going to take me out of myself. It's going to cost too much for me to give too much time. I don't feel like energy. I don't feel like money. I don't feel like, no, I don't feel like doing that. No. And people say, well, you should give that person a reason. Well, you could, but you don't have to. Just say no. Yeah. And, you know, and that's you have to say no. And you, especially you're going to be a parent, you have to be able to say no. Yeah. Some of the worst that's kids in this world are kids whose parents never told them no. And they become, you know, teens and adults who have such a sense of entitlement mm -hmm. and demand stuff from people. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. Like boys whose mothers and fathers never told them no will get a mm -hmm. girlfriend and feel like she, you know, if they want sex or whatever they want from her, she better give it to me because, you know, you can't tell me no. I've never heard no. Yeah. I get everything I want. Yeah. So, you know, that's, it's very important for you from everything I just heard mm -hmm. for you to be able to, um, to say no. To be yeah. You know? and, and it comes from like, you know, being strong in who you are and having a self-awareness too. Oops. Hello? Yes. Uh -huh. Like it comes from that to be able to say no, like to have a strong thing because you don't wavering. You know who you are. You know how to say no. And and, and a lot of it, if you self-caring, you know, I, I tell people, like, a lot of things I learned is because I was standing and watching somebody. There, there, there has probably in my whole life, this is the first time I'm talking to another adult person that's actually a therapist who's guiding me. Like, I've never had that in my whole life. Oh, and my God. Even, I mean, my mom will become like um, the the child to me in certain sense where I'm. So you step up, up and you be taking care of her too. Yeah, and and um and being rely on um by her and 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 things like that. So it, this year, I, I you know I hate the fact that that happened, but Miss Deb, I'm gonna be honest with you, I feel like I had to be shook into reality, like almost like I had to go to like the worst of the emotional pit in order to understand and pull myself out. It was almost like something in me said, "Oh no, this is not how we go down." <laughs> like yeah. we've been through too much to to get through school, to get an education, to finally feel like. I made it to then just be knocked down by somebody like that. Like no matter what we keep, we figure it out and we keep pushing. So that, that eight months of just like therapy and learning has brought me so much to a better place. Even to the understanding of, I think my mom has narcissistic personality disorder also. Yeah. It sounds like what you said. <laughs> Yeah, and girl, so, I need to um, move on and close. You know, uh, finish up the show. I got one more article to go over, and then sure. get out of here so we don't keep everybody forever. But I am just very happy to hear that you're in therapy. That's the the best part of the story. That you know you're giving yourself the help that, and support that you need, so that this doesn't happen to you again. Definitely. Okay, and remember too. You know, I heard you blaming yourself with that. You know, I'm attracting this person. I want you to understand one thing. There's two people in a relationship. You're, it's not your whole responsibility. They are attracted to you because they see someone that is, you know, vulnerable. 
So it's not that you're attracting them. You're just being who you are. They spy you because they're predators. Predators look for prey. That's what happened in this situation. Okay. So don't beat yourself up. It's not you. It's not your fault. Um, you know, because I hear a lot of women say, "Well, you know, I'm attracting this. I'm attracting." Because people like to say that. That's not the whole story. They are looking for people like you. You you, you don't have to be doing anything to attract them. They're going to show up though. But now you have the tool to send them on their way. That's the important part. Okay? And I'm listening and learning some more. Okay. Good job. All right. Thank okay. you. Oh, my goodness. My heart. Therapy is good if you have a good therapist. Now, there are some people that have therapy. They've been in therapy for years and they still all jacked up. So for them, I would recommend they get a new therapist. There are a lot of therapists that need a therapist because they crazy themselves and they cannot help you. They don't, they don't have their own stuff together. The best therapist I ever had in my life, I only saw him, I don't know, maybe six times. Um, I had, was working at this law firm and I was getting racially discriminated against and harassed by the HR director. I mean, it was like every freaking day this woman was on me. So one day I decided I wanted to go out on the stress leave in California. And they go out on the stress leave and, you know, your doctor signs you out and it's like for a month at a time. So I had a whole month with pay and I was on the stress leave. Okay. So what I did was I called my doctor. That had been my doctor for years. I said, doctor, I told her, give him a light rundown of what's going on. I said, I'm a very, I am so stressed right now. I just had a vision of me going to that woman's. And this is true. I did have this vision, but I wasn't going to do it. But the way I expressed it to him, he was so scared I was going to do it. Well, let me tell you what I said. I said, I, this, the office was on the 33rd floor. I said, I had a vision in, in Barcadero Center downtown. So I have a vision of me going into her office, taking a desk chair, you know, with a metal thing, breaking that window out and pushing her body out the window. That's what I just thought of. I'm just itching to do it right now. You have to help me. And he said, I want you to get in a cab. I will pay for it. Come straight to my office. Don't do anything. I left. I went to his office. He called his my work, told him that I was out on the stress leave for the next 30 days. And that was it. That 30 days I used to give me an attorney. I sued the fuck out of them. And I won. So there you go. But see, I needed that time away from work. I can't be at work and be at, you know, at the attorney's office and doing what I needed to do. I need to be at home. I need to be at home so I could do what I needed to do. But I really was. He really was driving me crazy. It really was a highly stressful situation. And I really did think of workplace violence. But was I going to do it? No, I would have quit before that happened. But my doctor didn't know that and that worked in my favor. So what they do, um, he sent me to this therapist that he personally knew. Old white dude, an ex-hippie, best therapist ever. Because the fact that he was a hippie type, you know, he was familiar with all kind of races, all kind of stuff. You know, he had seen everything. He was retired. He used to be an attorney and he retired. And then he went back to school and became a, a psychologist. So, you know, he could, he, I mean, he was the absolute perfect person for me. He knew the work. He knew the types of personalities I was dealing with. And he was a therapist and he understood black people's pain and racism and all stuff. I mean, my doctor, that doctor that I had at that time, he was on it. I mean, it was perfect. So I go in, I see this guy, right? And I tell him what happened. And he was so empathetic, so supportive. He gave me some different strategies to, you know, to how to deal with it. And, you know, I mean, they're listening. I did, he didn't know that I wasn't going to be putting it to use because I was going to be deuced out after I filed this lawsuit. But see, I didn't tell him all that part. He didn't do all that. He was there to try to help me. And, so, and he really did because I was able to take those tools and use them in other, you know, jobs that I had in the future. The dude was phenomenal. I just, I could not say enough good things about that guy. And he, we got everything done in six sessions. And I don't see why people have to be in therapy for years. I just don't understand that. I mean, I know they have these new things where it's only 30 minutes and you own Zooms and all this old stuff here. I used to go to his office and it was a 55-minute session. At least that's how much he gave me. I don't know if everybody's was that long. I had six 55-minute sessions. I mean, and I left. I was cool after that. I was cool.
cool. So I say all that to say that's why you have to, you know, get a therapist that hits the ground running, that don't waste your time. And, you know, you tell them what's going on and they say, well, what do you think you should do? Get up and walk out of that therapist's office because that is a bullshit person that's there to collect a check. They're not trying to help you. You don't want somebody that's going to say, what do you think you should do? If I knew what to do, fuck, I wouldn't be here. Did you think of that? That's why I'm paying you. You're supposed to be the one thinking. It's ridiculous. Oh, yeah, I sued them. Oh, honey, they was too through. Yeah, I don't know. I think that is a guilty thing. You say rarely. I never feel guilty because it's like, you know, even if I fuck somebody over, I did it on purpose. I wanted you to be fucked over. I'm actually gleeful, not guilty. Different word with a G. Gleeful, okay? And if I did something and it was an accident and I hurt you, I will apologize. But I still don't feel guilty because it was an accident. Why do I need to feel guilty for? But I'm telling you, most of the time, though, I'm pretty careful about what I do. Most of the stuff I, if I'm saying something mean to you, I wanted to say something mean to you. If I crack your face and make you cry, that was the goal. If I just dog you out and just do whatever that, that just puts, you know, puts a hurt on you. Yay for me. I wanted it to turn out that way. I'm absolutely thrilled at the results being achieved. So there's no need for me to feel guilty. Yes, that's what they do, Amina. They just be milking. Well, what do you think you should do? What do you think your approach should be? I don't need a therapist for that. I could sit there and talk to myself in the mirror for that and come up with the same stupid answer for free. Okay, you're supposed to be here guiding me to do something different. Yeah, I don't know. Guilt is not even in my vocabulary. I used to joke that I don't even know how to spell it. So let's finish up this show by going over this. This guy, this article breaks down the 10 stages that you go through when falling in love. And I thought this was pretty interesting. So stage one, you realize that you're more interested in a person than just being just a friend right? You're like, oh, wow, you know, he's so cute and he's so fun and he's so smart and, you know, I just really like being around him and my family likes him too. It's like, oh, maybe I don't want to just be friends, right? You start thinking about, you know, what it'd be like to kiss him and all this kind of stuff, right? You start thinking about things a little differently. Okay, so then you get a little preoccupied with him. You know, you sitting up there and you're supposed to be washing the dishes and suddenly you're all you know, looking into the distance and you're picturing his face, right? You start thinking about him at odd times. It'd be cool. And then comes stage three, the idolization phase. That's where everything they do is just so cute. He picks his nose. Oh, he has the cutest boogers. He farts. Oh, his farts smell like perfume. <laughs> his feet stink. Oh, they don't smell that bad. You just spray some, you know, some lights off of you. <laughs> you think about the gray sweatpants? That's because you nasty. <laughs> oh my God, you guys be killing me. <laughs> okay, in stage four, there comes awkwardness and insecurity. That's when people write, I don't know what we're doing here. I don't know how he feels about me. You know, I like him, but I'm not sure if he feels the same. That's the insecurity part, right? You know, and you're scared to say anything, you know, or you get around him and, you know, you get tongue tied, you can't breathe, you stumble over yourself, the your words, are, you know, you just start feeling weird, even though this has been your friend for two years. You never had this problem before until the day that you decided you liked him, right? Now, all of a sudden, it's all weird. All right. Stage five increased intimacy so you say no, i kind of like you i i just like just to be more than friends how do you feel about that he's like me too oh, i'm so happy you feel the same way and you're like oh my god i was so scared i didn't want to lose the friendship and he's like oh me either that's why i never said anything i'm glad you had the courage to you know i was like i feel like i need to put on little faces while i do my skit <laughs> there's no like little faces that they have on the stick so it looks like a, somebody different faces. That's why I need to give me some of those. Okay, so um, 
you know, he's feeling insecure. You're feeling insecure. You know, that's what. The, okay, so then you move to stage five to increase intimacy. Usually, this is where you have your first kiss, your first mattress session, you know, something like that. It marks a land, you know, a milestone in the relationship. You cannot go back because either you're friends with someone or you're lovers, friends, lovers. Once you cross over to the lover zone, there's no going back to just friends. You can't do that. Okay. Yes, wouldn't that be fun? I'll have to go and see if I can find some of them faces at the at the uh, art store or something. Okay, yes. So there you go. Stage number six, exhilaration. Okay, so you finally got the goods. It's like, oh my God, I can't believe it. It's so wonderful. He's so fabulous. Oh, he's so fine. And he could be on the gray sweatpants page. That's how Dude, it's just working it. It's just unbelievable. I just never had it so good in my life. Oh my God, I saw Jesus. I saw stars. I saw Mars. I saw everybody. Okay, so now you just beside yourself. You just turned into a complete fool. You don't know what to do. Okay. Yeah, you be thinking about should I cross the line? Should I cross the line? What should I do? You meet clients where they are. That's like I said, that's the last night. That's the last question. I helped them come up with the own solution. Oh, uh, mm, that doesn't work. I mean, that might work for some people, but I think by the time, Marilyn, most people go to therapy, they don't have any answers. They've already asked themselves that they've already tried to come up with some solutions. They're looking for you to help you to give them some. Give them some options. Give them choice A, B, and C. And ask them, which one do you think would work best for you, if any? At least you give them something. Okay, give them a path to go on. It just it's making people come up with their own solutions when they already don't know what the hell they're doing. It's just like a waste of time to me. That's why I I, I, I find it works better when you give them, you tell them what they did. You know, they tell you your problems, right? You analyze the problem say, okay, I see where you went left here. You know, you went left on this other one and then you took a sharp right. And then you ended up in hell. Okay, that's how you got there. Now, let's talk about how we're not going to do that no more. And how we're going to get you back from hell to where you need to be. Bam. Okay. Okay, you might give options, Marilyn. But I'm telling you, some people, the therapists don't. I mean, I've talked to, you know, thousands of people. They come through here and go to therapy. They don't give them options. They don't give them anything. They just ask them, well, what do you think you should do? And then it'd be, they sit there because they don't know what to do. And it's just it's a very horrible, ridiculous thing. Yeah, I think I think you're right, Nita. That's um, that's why I, I don't do it that way. But then, of course, I'm not licensed. So I have that flexibility. But I think my method works very, very well. I think, you know, it gets right to the point. Yes, it's very, I think it's cruel, Marilyn. I think it's, it's very cruel. For them to do people like that and then it just they're just turning their insurance I, I that's my interpretation because you know the, obviously the people are there because they don't know what to do they need help the ones that don't make it here because i don't know you know if they come here and ask me i tell them you know no nah, this is where you went left bring your ass back here by doing this 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 and this and this here and then that's it that's what you need to do now go do it and then, I, you know, they can figure that part out. I'm not going to tell them everything, but I will at least give them, a, you know, a few. I'll put them on the path to where they need to be. That's what I do. Okay, so exhilaration. Okay, that's when you get the goods and it's all just like all fabulous and you just don't even know what to do with yourself. Then you go to stage seven, which is the freak out. This usually happens around the three month mark. You know, I call it the 90 day bomb. You guys may have heard me talk about that. The 90 day bomb where you know everything's going really well and then at that point the person's gonna be like oh my god i'm in a relationship this is really this could be serious what in the world i might not be single anymore my life has changed all of a sudden i can see myself married with a mortgage and a, three children and a dog and a white picket fence oh no and a dad bod what shall i do and usually it's the dudes that freak out at the three month mark they just start freaking out you know um, I don't tell nobody's business. I mean, I uphold that. If I if I was the kind that would tell everybody's business, I would not be able to be in this business for 30 years. Okay. 
I don't be telling, you know, so you got to learn how to keep your mouth closed. Well, that's what I'm trying to tell y'all. Stop talking so damn much. Now, how would I be if I did the same thing I tell you not to do with men? I don't tell people's business. People tell me all kind of stuff. And I, and you know where it stays? Right here. Because if they wanted you to know, they would tell you themselves. That's my motto. Okay, so stage seven is the freak out point. Oh, my God. This is getting really intense. <gasps> and I don't know what the fuck to do. Okay. And people start, you know, they kind of back off. You might not hear from them for a month or a week or two weeks or two months or whatever. You know, they just like flip out. They just go crazy. They might, you know, start deciding they need to date other people to make sure that this is the right thing to do. And, you know, I mean, all kind of horrible things will happen during that while people are freaking out. You know, they call up their ex or they see their baby mama or something. It's just, you know, it's different situations. Okay, then you move on to stage eight. You make it through the freak out phase. You all still a couple, and uh, yeah, the ninety day, um, the ninety day bomb. I mean, you can just about look at your watch and time it. Okay, so stage eight: jealousy and possessiveness. So when you get in a closeness, one person's trying to get closer, the other person's retreating. And that person comes back and this person's like all suspicious because why did you go? So then they retreat. So it's this, you know, little dance that may go on for a month or so. And then, um, you know, during that time, though, there's jealousy and possessiveness comes up quite frequently. Um, you know, the person while they were, uh, you're feeling jealous because while they were on their little 90 day bomb routine, they, you know, went out with an ex or they went out with somebody from work or they, you know, something while they were trying to figure out if you and the situation that they have with you is really what you know what they want um are they really through dating other people is this really going to be serious you know so i try to caution women don't be too bent out of shape when that happens because that is a normal thing a lot of women do it too you know call up their ex to see what he's what he's doing or i mean people that's it's that 90 day mark if you make it through that then on the other side of that then you guys have a really solid thing but that first three months, I really wouldn't put too much stock in that until you make it past that bomb stage. Okay, so you do that and then you move to state, uh, you know, uh, state nine, whether you decide if you're going to do it or not. Right? Whatever this is, it's going to be locked down. It's going to be a relationship. Some people start talking about moving in together. Uh, my husband started talking about get, let's get married. I was like, oh, hell to the no. Nobody looked at you. <laughs> no, let's not do that. You know, so it just depends on the age of the man, his financial um, status and, you know, all this kind of stuff, you know, his where his mind is. Uh, it, it depends on a lot of stuff. But, you know, if he's a mature dude, he got his shit together. He's, you know, his career's established. He's, you know, owns property. He's, you know, he's ready. He's ready to create an environment where he can bring a wife and some kids and he can take everybody and everything's, you know, rolling like Bart, then he's most likely going to be on the do. If he feels like, you know, you're the one from him, it's just going to be do and it's going to be go from that point on. Um, the ones who aren't sure are going to run away like screaming and then that relationship will be over and then you'll move on to repeat that process with someone else until that 90 days comes around again, you're going to go through the same shit all over again. It's unavoidable. It is a phase that people and couples and relationships have to go through. It usually is right around three months mark, maybe four for some people, who, you know, maybe don't see each other as often. It, theirs might be stretched out to the four month period. You see each other a lot. It might come before three months, but you know, Three months is the average, 90 days. And then the final stage, you've managed to make it through step nine without fleeing in terror. Chances are you and your partner have had a good talk and decided to make a go of the relationship. This is awesome. A sincere partnership with someone you really care about is one of the most beautiful and fulfilling things a person can experience in a lifetime. And real love is the most powerful force on the planet. That's how they closed out the article. So that was what I was just reading you was uh, falling in love, the 10 stages that you'll go through uh, when you're falling in love. And, you know, we, like I said, have talked about that 90 day bomb thing. Um, 
a couple of times. And then at that point, once you get to that um, that final point where you are in a relationship, that's when things should start happening. Things should start forming up, uh, firming up. Things should start taking place. Plans would be made and things would be put into motion. If you, you know, are with someone for that period of time, a year, and nothing is moving forward, there's no motion in it, you would do well to reevaluate. You might love him and he might love you, but if there's something that you want, remember that time does not stop, okay? You, the clock is always ticking. You're, you're getting older, he's getting older. Your eggs and, and his stuff is getting older. The older it gets, the more, op, the more opportunities for birth defects and learning disabilities and all kind of other stuff. So, you know, if you, you know, you have a, a window for an even higher uh, likelihood of having a healthy baby, that's going to be, you know, when you're younger, in your 30s and stuff. So you don't want to waste your whole 30s tipping around with some dude who doesn't decide, doesn't want to make a decision about what he wants. You give him a, whatever amount of time you want to have, 8 to 12 months at the most, and he's not talking about what you're trying to talk about. You deuce out and you go to someone else. You do not spend four, five, six, ten years of your life. Then by the time he decides he wants to do something, you're too old to have a baby. I mean, well, you know, where you could feel like you would be, the risk would be too high for, you know, Down syndrome or whatever. And, you know, and keep quiet as this Kev likes us to, was talking about a couple of weeks ago. It's not just the women. It's more mainly the men. Old daddies make raggedy babies. So all these men in their 50s and stuff trying to get somebody pregnant, the kids are going to be fucked up. You don't want to do that. Even if you're older, have you pregnant by somebody who's still in his 20s or 30s. You have a baby, get it by, have it by a younger dude, then your kid won't be all messed up. The old men have the, the, the they're going to give you some raggedy old defective baby, and you're going to be sitting up there looking all crazy when you when your kid pushing your kid around in a wheelchair and shit. Baby all like, <clears throat> and you'd be like, oh no, what happened? This wasn't my fantasy of my precious darling. Since you had an old motherfucker for the father. You shouldn't have done that. Now, yeah, we, we talked about that. I don't remember which, which video that was, but we talked about these old men trying to have a baby. Ooh, and we have some nurses on this channel that work in you know pediatrics. And they was all full of all the information about the old fathers and what, um, you know, what happens. So, and this is firsthand somebody with 20 years experience, okay, talking. So don't, don't even dismiss what I'm saying here. If some old ass man want to have a baby, you tell him to take his grandpa ass somewhere else and have, have to something. Yeah, I know we did talk about that, but I don't remember. Maybe it was on the community wall. I don't, I forgot. But anyway, wherever it is. But yeah, that's very important. Yeah, you can look online to see them old, old man looking baby, babies looking like Jimmy Durante and stuff. <laughs> Not cute at all. You know, new babies be supposed to be plump and fresh and new, you know, have good color on their little skin and stuff. Healthy looking little hairs and stuff. And then you get them old babies, they look like, and they be all dried up and already have lines and wrinkles and stuff. And no, that's not cute at all and you you know be looking all crazy and having defects mm -mm. don't do it don't do it so anyway that's what we are talking about about love the lady that i interviewed today was our first interview for february she is talking about um trusting your gut that's gonna be that's the title i'm gonna put on the thumbnail trust your gut how many women right here who second guess themselves, they doubt themselves, they question themselves. Oh my God, when she wrote me and said that that was what her talk was, I immediately grabbed her because this is so important. So many women get themselves in dangerous situations because they second guess themselves. They don't they don't take protective measures and listen to this, oh, this don't, this don't feel right. This dude is creepy. This situation don't feel right. And leave, they second guess themselves. They, you know, they get mad and they cuss somebody out and then they second guess themselves. Oh, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Why, why don't women trust themselves more? So that was the question that she answered and very well. And I can't wait to run that video. So, um, 
gut and paranoia if it's about your safety it doesn't matter which one it is get the fuck out of there okay you can worry about semantics later that's that's my motto because see just by you asking that question you're doubting yourself your intuition it's called female intuition your gut your your that inner knowing is telling you that this is this is some fucked up shit right here i'm out i need to get out of here i need to run i don't need to be here something's wrong something about to go down wrong i've listened to mine and it saved me and my friends from a situation i told you who was i telling i think it was i talked about it with at uh first fridays at it's a place in san francisco when the nignog came in from hunter's point Potrero hill just like and just we only had four four or five security guards there at the doors they bum rushed the security guards, stampeded their way in there and started robbing people. And what happened was, see, like, I'm always, and I had parked away because I told my friends, well, if there anything happens, I like to always really get out on foot and make it to my car. They're not going to have my car, like, locked up in a parking lot or blocked in or nothing like that. I know how Negroes are when it's a big party like that. So they was mad because I made them walk two blocks in heels to the place, right? So then we decided we're having drinks and we're having a good time. And I could just commotion, right? At the door, I could hear some raised voices. So I lean back, I look down the hall, I see a crowd of knuckleheads. Now, at first Friday, everybody's wearing suits and, you know, dressed really nice. It's like black buppies, okay? You know, like the middle class, educated, MBA having crew. That's, you know. So I tell the three girls, I'm going to come, come on, y'all, we need to go. Why? Why? You know, this and that. I said, okay, you riding with me? Get get up. We're leaving now. So I took them out the side door and went, you know, we walked across the parking lot and on the street and we got to the car. As we were leaving out the parking lot, you could hear all the screaming and all the people, they bum rushed the door and they stampeded over the security guards and they was, they was pushing people, hitting people, spitting the men snatching purses snaking chains and shit off of people's necks robbing people of their watches they just went crazy. it was like a, 200 of them i mean what could they do with five security guards it was crazy it was crazy it was like on channel two news and everything we was in the car we made that turn hit the freeway and we was back in oakland and they were so happy they're like oh my god i'm so happy you you know you made us leave and we listened to you and all this kind of stuff and it's like my gut told me before we even went in there to park over here because some shit was going down i listened to myself and i didn't want to walk two blocks in my heels either but i'm so glad i listened to myself and sometimes don't you have like a, a little thing that'll tell you don't you go this way go this other way and then you find out later there was a big accident or a fire blocked the street or you know something funky happened right something funky that if you had gone that way and didn't listen to your inner, that little voice that said, don't do that. Like people are talking about a, something that told them, don't catch that flight and the plane goes down. That you got to learn to trust yourself and hear yourself and pay attention to yourself when it's warning you. If you doubt yourself and you say, oh, I'm just being paranoid. And you get on the plane and your ass is dead, then what you going to do? Plane going down. Oh, no, I thought I was just being paranoid because you doubted yourself. Pay attention, listen to yourself, trust yourself. And it doesn't matter. You can catch another plane. It doesn't matter if you were paranoid. Oh, well, but you're alive to talk about it. That's my motto. Don't worry about that because we always feeling like if you, you've got to judge yourself whether it's paranoid or not. You're paying it, you're more concerned about what other people think than you are paying attention to yourself. That's what that's where that comes from. You're concerned about what they're gonna say. Oh, you just paranoid. I don't care what they say. I worry about myself, you know, worry about taking care of yourself. Trust yourself, lady. So anyway, that's why I wanted her to talk. It's a great, great conversation. And I think, you know, something that's really, really important for uh, us. So that's what we're going to be talking about. This is our theme for February. It starts on February 1st. So if you're not already a subscriber to the channel, please hit that subscription button. So you'll get a notification for each upload and an announcement for each of the of the live streams that we have for the guests that are being scheduled. In the meantime, be sure to hit that like, 
that subscribe button and share share any video on the channel we appreciate your support so all in all i want to just thank everybody for coming paying attention to you know what love means to you and how you conduct yourself and treat yourself and love how you respect yourself and how you let other people treat and respect you this is very important we'll be going a lot of this kind of conversation as we move forward in february and the rest of the year you guys go out and enjoy the rest of your weekend a little bit that we have left i'll see you later on tuesday as a matter of fact bye-bye <laughs>